I'm recording this narration from my bed. Yes, my bed in Brooklyn, in Bushwick in particular. Bushwick because you know that's where artists live. That's what all the trendy articles say. And I am a trendy person, at least according to the articles. Or I'm on trend. Maybe not trendy, but on trend. I am part of a wave, a zeitgeist. And I am a lazy. I am part of a zeitgeist of laziness. And I am proud of this laziness because this laziness resists capitalism. I'm so lazy that I'm not recording this in a voiceover booth. And that's why you'll hear all the beautiful ambient sounds inherent to a first floor apartment in Bushwick. 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 I'm just getting my money's worth out of my very high rent by repeating that I live in Bushwick. And now my lazy little self is going to read a 1920 essay by Christopher Morley. So here's an old ass essay on laziness called On Laziness. And of course, just then I tried to switch windows and my phone just mm, betrayed me. But I'm too lazy to start all over. I just have to go with the flow. So rather than stopping this narration, I'm going to attempt to switch back to the window I need on my screen and read what I'm supposed to read. Okay, here it is. Here's the old ass essay. Today, we rather intended to write an essay on laziness but we were too indolent to do so. The sort of thing we had in mind to write would have been exceedingly persuasive. We intended to discourse a little in favor of a greater appreciation of indolence as a benign factor in human affairs. It is our observation that every time we get in trouble, it is due to not having been lazy enough Unhappily, we were born with a certain fund of energy. We have been hustling about for a number of years now, and it doesn't seem to get us anything but tribulation. Henceforward, we are going to make a determined effort to make... Henceforward, we are going to make a determined effort to be more languid and demure. It is the bustling man who always gets put on committees, who is asked to solve the problems of other people and neglect his own. The man who is really thoroughly and philosophically slothful is the only thoroughly happy man. It is the happy man who benefits the world. The conclusion is inescapable. We remember a saying about the meek inheriting the earth. The truly meek man is the lazy man. He is too modest to believe that any ferment and hubbub of his can ameliorate the earth or assuage the perplexities of humanity. O. Henry said once that one should be careful to distinguish laziness from dignified repose. Alas, that was a mere quibble. Laziness is always dignified. It is always it is always reposeful. Philosophical laziness, we mean, the kind of laziness that is based upon a carefully reasoned analysis of experience, acquired laziness. We have no respect for those who were born lazy. It is like being born a billionaire, millionaire, correction. They cannot appreciate their bliss. It is the man who has hammered his laziness out of the stubborn material of life for whom we chant praise and alleluia. The laziest man we know, we do not like to mention his name as the brutal world does not yet recognize sloth at its community value, is one of the greatest poets in this country. One of the keenest satirists, one of the most rectilinear thinkers rectilinear. He began life in the customary hustling way. He was always too busy to enjoy himself. 
He became surrounded by eager people who came to him to solve their problems. It's a queer thing, he said sadly. No one ever comes to me asking for help in solving my problems. Finally, the light broke upon him. He stopped answering letters, buying lunches for casual friends and visitors from out of town. He stopped lending money to old college pals and frittering his time away on all the useless minor matters that pester the good-natured. He sat down in a secluded cafe with his cheeks against a sidel of dark beer and began to caress the universe with his intellect. The most damning argument against the Germans is that they are not lazy enough. In the middle of Europe, a thoroughly disillusioned, indolent, and delightful old continent, the Germans were a dangerous mass of energy and bumptious push. If the Germans had been as lazy, as indifferent, and as righteously laissez-faireish as their neighbors, the world would have been spared a great deal. People respect laziness. If you once get a reputation for complete, immovable, and reckless indolence, the world will leave you to your own thoughts, which are generally rather interesting. Dr. Johnson, who is one of the world's great philosophers, was lazy. Only yesterday, our friend the Caliph showed us an extraordinarily interesting thing. It was a little leather-bound notebook in which Boswell jotted down memoranda of his talks with the old doctor. These notes he afterward worked up into the immortal biography. And lo and behold, what was the first entry in... Oh, I'm almost done. I just had to stop and scroll to see how much of the essay was left because I was getting tired. And lo and behold, what was the very first entry in this little, oop, in this treasured little relic? Now I have to make the text bigger. Dr. Johnson told me in going to Lamb from Ashbourne, 22 September 1777, that the way the plan of his dictionary came to be addressed to Lord Chesterfield was this. He had neglected to write it by the time appointed. Dodsley suggested a desire to have it addressed to Lord C. Mr. J laid hold of his of this as an excuse for delay that it might be better done perhaps and let Dodsley have his desire. Mr. Johnson said to his friend Dr. Bathurst, "Now if any good comes of my addressing to Lord Chesterfield, it will be ascribed to deep policy and address when in fact it was only a casual excuse for laziness." Thus we see it was sheer laziness that led to the greatest triumph of Dr. Johnson's life, the noble and memorable letter to Chesterfield in 1775. Mind your business is a good counsel, but mind your idleness also. It's a tragic thing to make a business of your mind, save your mind to bemuse yourself with. The lazy man does not stand in the way of progress. When he sees progress roaring down upon him, he steps nimbly out of the way. The lazy man doesn't, in the vulgar phrase, pass the buck. He lets the buck pass him. We have always secretly envied our lazy friends. Now we are going to join them. We have burned our boats or our bridges or whatever it is that one burns on the eve of a momentous decision. Writing on this congenial topic has roused us to quite a pitch of enthusiasm and energy. That's all.